So we've got a pretty exciting guest speaker this morning. I don't know about all of you guys, but since I was a little kid, I've been inspired by watching the performances of our military demonstration teams. They are truly remarkable. You know, what could be cooler than flying a fighter jet right off your buddy's wing at speeds, you know, 400 miles an hour these guys are going? So this morning, we're going to learn about what that is really like from someone who's not only done it, but who has commanded the US Air Force Thunderbirds. To get that conversation started, I'm going to bring Katie Pribble to the stage. I think most of you may know her. Those of you who've been here in the past will certainly recognize her. She was a senior vice president at AOPA, and she started this program. She led it from its inception all the way until early this year when she decided to move back to Montana to help out her family on their family cattle ranch. So she's an accomplished pilot in her own right. She, fly, she flew for the airlines before she joined AOPA. And today, she's an aircraft owner who routinely flies both for business and pleasure. And to give you an idea of just how much she loves that, every summer, her family actually carves a runway out of a field on the ranch so that she can land her plane close to home. How cool is that? So please welcome Katie Pribble. As you all know, uh, astronaut Ricky Arnold had planned to join us this morning, but due to a family emergency, wasn't able to make it. So on Friday night, I called up my good friend Kevin Robbins and gave him the opportunity to drop everything <laughs> and join us here this morning. And believe it or not, he actually agreed to do it. I met Kevin back in 2006 during his first year uh, commanding the Thunderbirds. And since I've known Kevin, uh, I've seen him go off to war college. Uh, he deployed to Afghanistan. And he was commander of the historic first fighter wing at Langley Air Force Base. When Kevin retired from the Air Force, uh, he went up to Anchorage, Alaska, and ran the equivalent of an airline up there as manager of the aviation department at ConocoPhillips. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Uh, I know that you probably didn't start your career doing interviews on The Daily Show with one of my favorite comedians, right? That's something you work up to. So tell us a little bit about how you got started in your aviation career that eventually lended, uh, led to the Thunderbirds and beyond. Like, what's your aviation story? Uh, I, I always kind of thought my aviation story started when I decided to go into the Air Force. But in reality, I grew up on a lake in Florida, directly across the lake from um, a seaplane base and an airport. And uh, our house was right under the, the most prominent flight path. So I saw a small aircraft right over my house, up close and personal, every day as a kid. And when I was real young, my dad, my dad was a pilot, and he flew. He didn't fly much past when I was real young, but um, I was actually with him in a seaplane when I was five or six, and we hit something on takeoff, and the plane got airborne, and um, in hindsight, I'm like, maybe my dad overcorrected, but we did, you know, one way, the other way, and then their wingtip caught, and the, the plane abruptly stopped and sank. So. Uh, at that time, I didn't think much about it after that. I didn't ever think I'd be a pilot. And uh, as educators, you guys know kids like I was, nobody, nobody talked to me about being a pilot or going to college. My parents didn't encourage me. What I might do as an adult. Um, so I finished high school, and you know, I wasn't going to be a pilot. I wasn't going in the Air Force. I wasn't, you know, and some, some little alarm started to go off in the back of my head about a year out of high school. And I said, if I don't get out of Central Florida right now, I never will. Not a bad place, but not where I wanted to be. And uh, so I packed up, I moved myself out to California to follow my oldest brother. And uh, he goes, hey, you need to go to college. And nope, he did a good job of convincing me. You, this degree might open a door for you later that uh, you don't even know you want open, which was true. And uh, so I paid my way through college and uh, got out, turned down a couple of job offers. And my brother said, hey, w what is it that you really want to do? If you could do anything in the world, what would you do? Uh, and this is a great question that I ask youngsters now because I told him what it was I wanted to do. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, if you could do anything in the world, what would you do? And during my Air Force career, I would never admit this, and I'm not admitting anything now, but this was around 1986. There may have been a movie that came out. <laughs> top dog, top something, I don't know. But I thought about it for a couple days, and I came back and said, if I could do anything in the world, I'd be a fighter pilot. And he goes, go do it. And I go, I, I can't do that. Other people do that. He goes, see, call them and see. And that's how my aviation story really got started. And uh, called the recruiter. Recruiter said, oh, you already have your college degree. You need an officer recruiter. Officer recruiter told me, no, you know, pilot, really hard to get a pilot slot. But we got a lot of other things for you to do. <laughs> and uh, 
So I was at his office the next morning at 7 a.m. in my one little coat that I had and tie, and, uh, and we went from there. I think that's an important point. You know, a lot of, we, we've heard a lot, and we know that you can go to the academy, and that's ROTC, but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you can join the Air Force and become a pilot in the Air Force and not necessarily take those more traditional routes. Yep, and the, the biggest thing out of that story for me was what I got to take on the Thunderbirds when you're talking to kids, and you know, you go, hey, you can do anything. Don't, don't believe that you can't. You know, don't let people tell you you can't. If you want to do something, figure out what the path to get there is and start on it. And uh, I'm sure that's a common thing for you guys that deal with kids, you know, every day. But, but for me, that was a big eye-opener. I, I feel a little bit like a bad friend because until this very moment, I did not know you were in a plane crash as a, as a child. <laughs> I was in the, we'll back, to cover that in the later. back seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so you joined the Air Force, and did your career go as planned? I mean, in your mind, you wanted to be a fighter pilot. Correct, but I really didn't even know what that meant, you know, and uh, I didn't know anything about the military, and so my career didn't go as I, as I planned or I thought because I didn't think I'd make it through. I mean, I was always concerned with washing out, and uh, back then the Air Force had this horrible program that they sent uh, pilot candidates who were not private pilots, they sent them to a thing called flight screening. It was in Hondo, Texas, and it was a bunch of retired Air Force pilots mostly and uh, that flew, and, and it was really a screening. My class started with 26 and only 11 made it through. And it was you know, flying at the military equivalent of a Cessna 172, and it was just, if you couldn't solo when it was time to solo, they washed you out. It was an incredible waste of taxpayer money, and I'm glad they don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But of those 11 that made it through, only five made it through pilot training. So you start with 26, and only five made it through pilot training, you're like, yeah, you're, you're worried about washing out. You know, that's, that was my big concern. And then you go through 13 months of pilot training, then you go to three months of lead-in fighter training, then you go to water survival, you go to wilderness survival, you go to escape and evasion training, then you go to your F-15 training for six months where they wash people out of that. And then once you make it through that, then you, you're starting to feel like, I think I'm gonna make it. And then you go to your first, uh, your first operational assignment for me, so. Okay, so combat squadrons, uh, a couple things in between, like you're in Washington, D.C. working for uh, Speaker of the House, I think, right? Uh, yeah, later, much later on. Much yeah. later on. Uh, and then the Thunderbirds call. You didn't call them, they called you. But, well. How did that exactly so go down? I didn't, want to, I didn't want to do the Thunderbird job. And so my, it's confusing to my family and the, the way that I found to explain it to them, I go, well, it's like ask, asking Wayne Gretzky to go do fantasy on ice. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I mean, he doesn't want to be doing fantasy on ice when, you know, his team wins the, the Stanley Cup, right? And I didn't want to be doing loops to music when, you know, F-15 squadrons were going to war, right? I'd prefer our nation stay at peace by all means, but if we're not going to be at peace, I wanted to be the first one to unsheath the sword. I mean, that's what I trained to do. And uh, so... They, they sent out interviews, I think they send out emails every year, the Thunderbirds, of what positions they have open, and I got it, and I just deleted it and moved on. I was in Japan, I got a call from uh, my wing commander, and he said, I want you put in. I go, no, yeah, I'm not the guy. He goes, no, you are the guy. You're gonna, you're gonna go, you're gonna put in for this. And uh, I was going to work at that base where the Thunderbirds are anyway. I had an assignment, so the people that I'm gonna interview with, I was gonna work for them one way or the other. And, uh, and the first question was with the two-star general of the interview. I had not met him before. He sits down and he goes, why don't you tell me why you want the job? I'm like, sir, I, I don't want the job. <laughs> and uh, I'm here because my wing commander asked me to put in, and I have a lot of respect for him. Not, not that my respect made any difference, right? He told me, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. But that's what I said. And he goes, well, why don't you tell me what you do if you got the job? And I was like, I expect him to go, thanks for playing, see you later, right? And, uh, and I said, well, I don't really know much about Thunderbirds. I don't follow them, so I have perceptions, I don't know if they're real. And he's very patient, he goes, why don't you tell me what your perceptions are? And then you tell me what you would do based on those. And I said, well, my perception is, they're a bunch of self-serving prima donnas that are in it for themselves, <laughs> and they're not doing, not doing what they ought to be doing, which is representing the regular Air Force. And he said, and what would you do to change that? I'm going to work for this guy anyway, right? So I said, well, I take them from being an air show squadron to being a fighter squadron that flies air shows. And I go, and that shift in mentality would make all the difference in the world. And he said, how are you going to do that? And about 25 minutes later, I realize I'm still talking, and he hasn't interrupted. And I'm like, to bed. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and as, as fate would have it, I learned more doing that job 
the job I was going to, it wasn't a, it wasn't a combat squadron. Uh, so I learned more doing the Thunderbird job than I would have ever, ever learned in that other job that I was going to. And it, and it opened up a whole world for me of being able to um, try different leadership techniques and different things to change an organization. And, and when it came down to it, the leadership, because I eventually asked after, it was a while, I'm like, why am I here? Why, why did you hire me? And I got called up to the two stars office and he told me. And uh, so they had, they had some concerns and they were looking for somebody to, to fix uh, things on the team that they weren't sure what was wrong. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, I, I got it. I stood up, saluted, walked out the door. And, but that, what that gave me was like a mandate, right? There's a rich heritage, there's a strong alumni uh, you know, organization associated with Thunderbirds. And that gave me the mandate to be able to go, no, we're not, I'm not afraid to change things. I'm not gonna, you know, I'll listen to the alumni, but you're not gonna affect my decision making and we're gonna change this team and you know, take it back to our roots a little bit. Great. Okay, so it's your first job, first day on the job as a Thunderbird commander. I don't even know how you start a job like that, right? I mean, is are you walking into a squadron and you're the only new guy? Has everybody been flying together? Is everybody new, or well, the, how does that work? The first thing I did was have, I had to go learn how to fly the F-16. So, um, <laughs> so it's probably June. You know, I, I'm going to be the commander the next. Not going to take command until February of the next year. But like in June, I go down to Luke Air Force Base, go through a three-month program. Um, and then show up at the squadron. And every year, the Thunderbirds change half of their officers. So there's 12 officers, uh, eight of them are pilots, four of them are support officers, but you're changing half of those every year, which means you're also changing half of the flyers. And uh, the enlisted troops, you know, the, the officers for the most part are on the team for two years, and the enlisted troops are on the team for typically three or four years. So they're constantly swapping out enlisted folks a little at a time, mm -hmm. but, but you have this so I don't walk in as the commander. I walk in and I go, I got three and a half months of overlap because the only person in the world who's current at flying the Thunderbird 1 position is Thunderbird 1, right, my predecessor. The only person that can fly left wing is that person on left wing. Left wing's not the same as right wing. It's flown very differently. You know, they do the same thing, but it's a lot of opposites. You know, they take you out, they took me out and I flew on the wing one of my first rides on the Thunderbirds. It's crazy, you do, you, you do an, a barrel roll on the left wing and you have almost a full boot or right rudder in while you're doing it. And you know, I'm no aero major, but I'm like, I'm not sure how this works, but <laughs> but I see that it works, you know. And they tell me, but uh, um, you know, so you you have this overlap. So for three and a half months, I'm there in the squadron, just flying the syllabus, learning to fly, learning more about the Thunderbirds, meeting people, and trying to do the right thing because people want to come in and they go, well, are you going to change this? Are you going to do this? Are you? And you know, the right thing is to say, I am not your commander, and I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to change. You have a commander, you can go talk to him about it. And you, and you wait, which made it one of the most frustrating three and a half months of my entire Air Force career, you know, watching what was going on and not being able to fix it yet, so. What was that first flight like? You mean the first time you were in formation, I imagine they put you in the diamond with somebody else. What was that flight like? So that was part of the syllabus as well, and, and uh, you never have anybody in a two-seater uh, when you're flying a show, but for a practice you can. So my first flight was in the back seat of number four's aircraft, and I'm, you know, I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fighter pilot, of course. I'm like, we all fly formation. We all do, you know, I'm like, this is just going to be a little closer. It, you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal. And so we do the, the diamond takeoff. So your, your four ship rolling down the runway, and then you lift off and lead, you know, lead says, stand by gear, gear up, ready now. Four goes slot. So four goes from the other side of three to he's going to go to the slot position. And, and he makes that first move. And I think we're going to hit the gear that is going up underneath un, under number three's jet. And I, I actually duck. <laughs> and then he pulls it up underneath lead and just sticks it. And I, I, I am white knuckle hanging on, staring at the bottom of lead's jet for the next five man, maneuvers before I really even started to look around. I, I, I literally was scared shitless. <laughs> and, and, and I never forgot that ride. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, fear is a great motivator for good execution, you know, because <laughs> I always was aware, uh, you know, four's right there. And they do this maneuver and trail where you go lead, two, three, four, stacked like this, and then you typically go into a turn or you do some maneuver, and then they go into the diamond when, you know, I call it. But that maneuver, if, if I backed off a tenth of a G, one tenth of one G during the roll in, and it's hard to roll in that, you know, it takes a while to learn that as you can imagine, but if I backed off one tenth of a G, I would hear about it in the debrief. 
because that would, two, two would make a little move down, then the bigger for three, and then it'd be a lot bigger for four. It's a ripple effect. And, uh, you know, so, and I can feel, especially in that maneuver, I can feel being pushed by the air going over number two's jet. You know, my, my jet, the tail, I could feel the tail end get pushed up. Um, so it's pretty close, and that, fir that first ride was an, was an eye-opener. So in the winter, when you're uh, first flying together, you're a new commander, I imagine that you guys are practicing out, and eventually you bring it in to, what, 18 inches, and sometimes you guys it, are tip it, to tip? Yep, you, we start the, start the show season at uh, three feet, and then it'll get moved in as everybody gains proficiency, you know, and you, um, but yeah, like I said, there's a syllabus and you, you fly that you got to fly the syllabus and do everything. And my first, you know, a couple of my first rides are me on the wing doing like I talked about. And then it's me with one wingman, you know, and, and, uh, and the, my predecessor in my back seat. And then once you get proficiency in whatever phase you're in, then you, I might go up by myself and lead a couple. And then the next thing we start to do is we add another aircraft. Now I got the, the current boss in the back seat again, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm briefing and leading and, and practicing these. So you guys practice a lot. I mean, how many months in winter? And well, then, I mean, and as you said in the video, up to nine times a week. Well, they, they flew, um, well, they flew even more before I took over. So during my training season, they would do what's called trip turning. So we would maybe fly three goes in one day. And so they're flying as many as maybe 13, 14 sorties in a week. Or, or you know, flights in a week, and I wouldn't maybe I wouldn't fly all those, but um, that's a lot of flights, and I, that was one of the things I didn't like. I'm like, this, it's just too much. You know, the, the accidents on the Thunderbirds all happen because of fatigue and you know all those things, and I'm like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna back off that when I take over, and at least in my own mind. I didn't tell anybody else that, but um, but you're you're flying a, a ton. Yeah, so you're practicing a lot, but every time you fly, you're you're putting your lives in each other's hands, right? And, you got to build a lot of trust. Trust is one of those things that takes a long time to build and can instantly be destroyed. So how do you do? I mean, how do you build trust amongst team members like that? It obviously, doesn't happen just when you're flying. There has to be a lot going on outside those jets right. that helps you build that as a squadron. I think it's building trust. I think is like any part of leadership. It's um, you set clear expectations. You hold everyone to the same standard, and you be really hard on yourself in front of other people. And you'd be as hard on yourself, if not harder, than everybody else. So when I would come in from a flight, you know, it's, it's no different than being in a regular fighter squadron. You know, I would critique myself very hard, talk about the mistakes I made, talk about how I can make better. You know, beat myself up in the debrief because I'm going to beat them up. Not maybe not as hard as I beat myself up, but I'm going to beat them up too. And they they need to see me take it. So that um, and then they they start to have that trust of opening up and realizing that admitting a mistake is actually a good thing and that we all have to do that in order to be safe and, and to build that trust. But I, I think, um, I don't think it's any different than in a normal squadron, but you know, you can't, you can't rest on that framework of rank either, right? It's, it's that way the higher you get in any position, but it, you know, I'm the commander of the Thunderbirds. You know, I could be like, I'm the commander of the Thunderbirds. But instead, I'm like, nope, I, I'm the commander. It's my job to command, but I, I'm just a pilot. When I'm leading, it's my, it's my place. And man, and I had to take it. You, you think about, you know, I may be biased, but the most difficult position to fly in the Thunderbirds is the number one position. Uh, you're, you're leading the whole thing, doing everything. And so you're more vulnerable to making mistakes. You know, number two is going to make mistakes, but they're going to be small. You know, and they're, they're not going to even be that visible most of the time. Number one makes, mis makes a big mistake, and, you know, it, it's pretty obvious, and everybody knows it. So, um, you know, I was a pincushion in the debrief, and I just, I, you got to take it, and I think that helps build trust. That's great. Um, I think we have a clip. Let's show a short clip of uh, Boss calling the show from inside the cockpit. I don't think this is you, but. Now, nose coming up, 460, right on, in, two, four, there's four, down and ready now. In to the flip. Who's in? I'll break you the line. One's on top, nine, two, two hundred, back in with the pull. On the line. Go spin, go spin. A little part back. A little more pull, a little more pull, a little so smoke on, ready now. Smoke on, ready now. 
All right. That wasn't you. I'm sure you had a little bit maybe different style, but I mean, that's a very unique cadence, and I don't know, had any idea what was happening there. Obviously, there's five and six are in there, and you're making calls, and. I can tell you one thing that happened on that. He called on top at 9.2, 9,200 feet, 200, 200 knots. Way too fast. <laughs> way, <laughs> way too fast. So, um, yeah, that, and that's scary, to, 200 knots right there. It's scary because you're going to point downhill and you're going to accelerate so fast as you're going downhill. And the, the faster you go, once you get above 350, 400 knots, the bigger your turn circle opens up. And you don't want your turn circle to open up when you're going towards the ground, right? So uh, 150 was the minimum I shot, I shot to be between 155 and 160 across the top. And uh, hearing him say 200, I was like, oh, I would have been, ugh. It just kind of sends, sends, a, sends a shiver there. Anyway, what was your question? <laughs> I was wondering what was going on as I'm watching you oh, react as you're watching this video. The cadence. Yeah, uh, the cadence. Tell yeah, me. Yeah, so that was something when I listened to it, I'm like, you know, fighter, fighter <laughs> communication, as you say, as little as possible on the radio. So I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of that is what I thought. But as I started to fly it, you realize, oh, no, you got it. You got to keep all that. And, uh, and it's a cadence, that, that cadence, which, I, you know, that sing-song cadence is, it helps the people that are flying formation off. You kind of know how hard you're pulling when you're easing off. And, and, and they just get used to that, your cadence, and, and so they know, they know. And then the rest of the comm, their safety comms, like he's making his on top call, altitude and airspeed. Uh, and number eight, who's the operations officer, is down on the ground watching this all, and he, he, you know, he's a safety observer, and he can call knock it off at any time through that as well. And then also, the whole thing's a dance. You know, the, the whole thing's a dance. So as for number eight, and for me, if, if number five or six, the solos, if they're late making a, fo uh, a phone call, a radio call, or they're, they, uh, they're behind, they, they miss a, ra a radio call, that's an indicator. You know, it might not be like, oh, that guy's behind today. But that is an indicator. And when the indicators start to stack up, that's where maybe you consider, hey, let, you know, let's knock the show off for a second and talk about it and see if we want to continue it. Uh, you definitely do that in practice a lot. And, uh, you, you know, you can't, can't be afraid to do that. But that, that, that's all part of the dance. And, and you you know, it helps you know that everybody's dancing correctly. Did it take a long time to learn? Yeah. There's so much going on, because I think that was five and six you could hear, because they're calling their own show all in the same frequency, right? Yep, and you have to, um, you have- Five and six are the solos, which are generally outside the diamond, right? Correct, right, until the, until the very end of the show. Yeah, um, yeah it, it took a long time to learn. And there's a lot going on, and you have to learn three shows. So you do the high show when the weather's good. You do a low show when you can do rolls but not loops kind of thing. And then you do a flat show when the weather's so low that you're not doing any type of, you can do aileron rolls, but you're not doing anything more than that. And uh, so it's a lot to learn. And, uh, you know, what I did was I took my prede predecessor's heads-up display tape from him flying the show, and I literally typed out, because it's not just the maneuvers, it's the how do you do the repositions. The repositions are maneuvers, they're not for the crowd, but those are maneuvers in, them, in their own right. You know, so how, how do you do this? So I typed out everything, you know, every radio call he made, how many degrees knows high he went, how far off heading he checked, you know, how long he held before, because he normally has uh, show center dialed in, so you can see how many miles he was from show center before he came back. I, I had all that for every single maneuver. It took me hours. I typed it in the computer so I could make changes to it easily, and I would just go over and over and over. And I'd, we talk about chair flying, I'd sit in the chair, and I'd go, and then I'm gonna check right to this heading, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring the nose up this high, I'm gonna ease off to this G, and you just go over it and over it and over it until you don't have to look anymore, you know? So you, you go through that and then you go, was I right? I go, oh no, it's 10 more degrees or whatever. Over it and over it and over it and over it. And, uh, you know, I don't know how the other pilots did it, but that's, how, that's yeah. how I did it. So routine, a lot of routine. You guys are flying 80 shows a year, practicing in between. Things have to become really routine. How do you avoid complacency? The, the biggest thing, and this is the biggest thing I would teach, I, I try to teach any young aviator is, you know, you got to approach flying with a humility. And uh, I was in a fire squadron that uh, there was a guy going away, and he was doing gag gifts for his going away. And we had this cocky young, uh, young flight, uh, he's a flight lead in the F-15. And, and he gave him, he goes, I got a gift for you. It's for your debriefing guide. And I want you to look at this before you go into any of your debriefs. 
And it just said in like the finest, the smallest font, you know, it said like 10,000 times on the sheet of paper, it was just jam packed in there, it said, I may have made a tactical error. <laughs> you know, and the point is you have to approach it with humility. So when you go, hey, how do you, how do you keep from getting complacent? You go, well, it could happen to me. And, uh, you know, I made a lot of changes on the team and we briefed upstairs and the hangar was our area where we briefed and, and our offices were and then we'd go down the stairs across the hangar and out uh, to fly when we practiced. And, uh, and the, the Thunderbirds had a uh, Quonset hut or something with a whole bunch of stuff in there. And so the public affairs was telling me some of the stuff they had. Well, they had this huge painting, gigantic original painting of, it was of the four pilots who crashed in 81, I believe it was. And the commander was kind of out front by himself looking at the ground and the, the rest of the three were behind. They were standing, standing up. So it wasn't aircraft, it was just them. And I said, I want you to take that picture. I don't know why it's in this Quonset house. And they go, well, we didn't, we didn't want to be reminded, you know, is what we heard is why it got moved out. And I go, yeah, I want you to take that painting. I want you to put it right th at the top of the stairs where we walk out to go fly every day. Because I wanted, I told our guys, I go, why? Because they weren't thinking they were going to crash that day. You know, and we have to remember that it might happen to you. So I briefed every one of those sorties. How do you say the same thing over and over and over again? but say it in a different way, that they, you know, that they hear it differently. But I included abnormal procedures in every brief. Let's talk about we're doing this maneuver and you get this light, you know, or you get the jet lurches to the left. And then we go from there, how, how are we gonna take care of that? Every now and then I go, okay, the bomb bursts cross, I, I plow in a mile from the runway, smoke and hole, go through what's gonna happen. You know, th those are the things that, so I, I was a constant reminder to the, to the team and the pilots especially to be like, hey, you can't afford to be complacent. And we were, you know, we'd, we'd fly across the country every week, right? Normally on Thursdays, we'd fly to whatever show we were. And we, we would take, a, we had these little bags that we would uh, put in the cockpit so that we at least had some stuff if the, the big plane didn't make it. And one day I saw a couple of little guys jamming uh, magazines in there. And I, we were on our way out to the jet and I stopped and I go, if you guys are pulling those magazines out and looking at them at all on the flight, you're wrong. And they're like, no, boss. And I go, okay, I'm just telling you. You know, but I, if I saw anything like that, because those flights get boring after a while, you're like, boring flying F-16? Yeah, I mean, you do it every week. And, uh, but I didn't think they were reading those magazines, but on the outside chance that they were, I was gonna call them out on it. Uh, let's talk for a little uh, minute about celebrity. I don't know if I'd call it a dark side, but there has to be something pretty exhausting about um, uh, this, the, the constant signing or asking for autographs. I mean, you met world leaders, which is amazing. You're on The Daily Show. But how do you stay grounded in, in, a, in a job like that? Because it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, mean? I, I felt like I was finally <laughs> getting my due, what I deserve. Because uh, uh, I'm Maybe a self serving <laughs> prima donna that's in it for myself and not, yeah. Um, you know, I, I would remind the team too, you know, that I'd be like, well, if, if I carried my show suit, if someone carried my show suit around an air show on a hangar, people would ask it for its autograph. I mean, there's no doubt, you know, but you remember, you, you reminded that like, whoever's wearing that thing, people are gonna ask them for, at an air show, people are gonna ask them for their autograph. And you know, it's, it's, not, it's not me, I'm holding a position and I'm not gonna get drawn in. And, uh, I did, I did it in small ways, uh, but, it, but it's exhausting because it takes effort to, to push against that. And I would argue, I hit on it earlier, I would argue that it's the same for anybody when you get high up in your company, you get high up in the Air Force, you get, you know, where, whatever you are, as you start to get higher and higher up, you have to remember that you're losing touch with the people beneath you and that people are starting to do things, and, and pretty soon you just start to believe that you deserve all that. And I think it's a very slippery slope. And so I believe that before I ever went on the Thunderbirds, but just things like Thursday morning, I show up at squadron. I get, you know, I'm bringing my bag to go, you know, to the air show. And, uh, you know, I got five guys that want to take it out to the C-17. Boss, we'll grab that for you, come on. And I'm like, no, I got guys, I got, hey, how's it going? You know, and I would walk it out. And if there was a bag sitting by the door before I went out on the tarmac with mine, I'd grab that bag. And I'd take it out to the C-17, I'd say hi, and thanks to everybody that's loading the aircraft, I'd go say hi to the C-17 crew. And, uh, but I tried not to let anybody do anything for me that I could do myself, even if it took some time, just, as, just kind of as a reminder. And I would go to the shows, you know, I would go in shorts, flip-flops, and a t-shirt. And I would 
take my uniform with me and I'd put it on once I got into, into our room before our brief. I, I, I'm just like, I'm not going to wear that thing around if I don't need to because I don't need that kind of attention on myself. So um, you're flying those maneuvers, you're putting a lot of stress on your body. How do you guys handle the physical demands of, of flying air shows? Well, it, and practicing day in and day out. To me, that's part of mission focus. You're going to do whatever it takes that you need to do at the time. And so, um, you know, I have a 10-month-old daughter. And uh, so I'm doing physically what I need to do for her. You, you know, she requires a softer, more rounder dad body. I think it's called a dad bod. So I'm working on my dad bod right now. But, uh, <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing great. I, paid, I, I wouldn't want to try to put that show suit back on right now, but um, but anyway, I didn't need a dad bod to fly the Thunderbird shows. I needed to I needed to be in good shape because it's physically demanding when you're you're flying that many times a week. You're flying back and forth across the country, you're flying the air shows. You're doing all that, and uh, it's the same in a fighter squadron. So I I convinced myself I need to reconvince myself, but I convinced myself that you know that gym time was me time, you know, I, I called it going to the chapel, I go, I'm going to the chapel, you know, and it, but that's me time, and I want to pay myself first, so first thing in the morning, I want to pay myself and go get that gym time, and, and you know, I just convinced myself that that's, that was for me, it wasn't for anybody else, and I needed to do it, and, uh, and it kept me going to the gym and, and working out, and most everybody worked out pr pretty well, and fighter squadrons in general, but on the Thunderbirds. Yeah. So um, we talked about the physical demands. There's got to be mental demands as well. I think we've kind of touched on these a little bit. But how do you mentally handle going from a combat squadron, which is what you loved and what you, why you got into the Air Force, to flying what you describe as loops to music? It, mentally, how do you for me, make that it, switch? You know, it's, uh, it's just that mission focus. It's, it's the same thing in a fire squadron that maybe you know, I have to communicate to the squadron that, uh, you know, we're going to do this thing that everybody thinks is an idiotic idea. And, uh, you know, different leaders have different views of loyalty. And some of them, you know, they say you just have to agree with everything. And uh, to me, I'm like, well, that's, that's not the best thing for your organization. So I wouldn't ever slam leadership, but I would say I recommended a different course of action than this. This was not the one that I chose. But since this is the one that's been decided on, we're going to do it better than any other squadron in this wing, or we're going to do it. We're, we're going to do it. So I didn't want to go to the Thunderbirds. But when I got the job, and especially when they said, well, we hired you to fix some stuff, then I go, well, I'm going to, I'm going to knock this out of the park. Yeah. And I'm going to make this a fun squadron to be in. And I'm going to make us do our job better. And um, so to me, it, it was a transition to a different type of thing. But it, it wasn't. The mindset was still the same of what I had always done. Were you treated differently when you went back to? Well, yes, flying? but not because I was a Thunderbird. I mean, the next time I really went back to fly, I was a colonel. So uh, you know, I went off to a, a staff job and yeah. school and all that. And so yeah, you walk in as a colonel, you get treated. Uh, you know, you're not Hollywood anymore. You're Colonel Hollywood, and you know. It, <laughs> so, uh, but it's tough. but for the most part, um, you know, a lot of the changes that I made in the in the in the Thunderbirds. I mean, it it made people in the fighter community know me better and, uh, and be appreciative of what I was doing. Like, like just things like uh, we're going to Tyndall Air Force Base for an air show and it's a F-15 training base, right? I'm an F-15 guy. I know a bunch of people there. They go, hey, we're having a roll call. So they're getting together in the bar on Friday night, the, Friday night of the air show. So I tell, our, I tell the pilots, I go, oh, by the way, I'm going to roll call at the such and such squadron at Tyndall. So if you, you know, I'm taking a green bag. If you want to go, I'd recommend bringing a green bag. There's no it's way I'm green, walking in a green bag is a, a green flight a suit. green flight suit instead of the blue show suit. And uh, did I have to fight public affairs to wear the green, the green flight suit on the Daily Show? I go, no, I'm not wearing that thing on the Daily Show. Um, but anyway, the pilots go, the pilots tell me, they go, well, boss, we're not allowed to take green flight suits on the road. And I go, says, says who? And they go, well, we're just not allowed. I go, is it written down anywhere? And they're like, no. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm taking a green flight suit, and if you guys want to show up. So th all the Thunderbird officers showed up in the squadron bar in green, just regular old green flight suits on the road in an air show, and that spread like wildfire through the fighter community. Did you guys go to roll call? People would see me and go, did you guys go to the roll call at Tindall? I'm like, yeah. When, when I was training, one of my training flights, um, you know, Nellis Air Force Base with the Thunderbirds are is a very busy base, and they've got a lot going on. Well, there was a unit. Well, I'm coming into land in my Thunderbird 1 red, white, and blue shiny jet. And unfortunately, the smoke switch is exactly the same place where the speed brake switch is in an <laughs> F-15. And when you land in an F-15, you normally put the speed brake up to aero brake. And then you, so the pattern's full. 
you know, just like Maverick, pattern's full, <laughs> no Ghost Rider. But uh, pattern's full, and I come in to land, I touch down, I do the speed break, which turns out is the smoke, you know, and all of a sudden I hear from Tower, they're like, Thunderbird 1, you're smoking, Thunderbird 1, you're smoking. And I was like, ah, you know, so I stop, because I, I don't see it, right? So I turn it off, and then here's these guys from another base that are there supporting the operations that now, and it, let's say they're Taurus, you know, Taurus flight. Taurus 1 is on the go because of Thunderbird 1's smoke. <laughs> so the guy behind him, Taurus 2 is on the go because of Thunderbird 1's smoke, right? So they're just, in, in most of the jets have tone buttons on the radio, so the tower frequency is like beep, beep. You, know, hit, you hit the tone button when you want to give someone grief, you know? So what do I do? I could just go back, but no. That's part of, I'm trying to change the Thunderbirds, and I'm, one of my target audiences is the fighter community in the United States Air Force. I go directly from my airplane to my car. I drive to the Class 6, which is the liquor store. I buy two <laughs> cases of beer. I call the, the pilot who's sitting in the tower. I go, hey, who's Taurus Flight? He tells me where they are, where they're operating out of. I drive over there, two cases of beer. Sorry about the smoke, fellas. You know, blah, 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 Thunderbird 1, or Hollywood. But you know, And I left it on there. That spread like wildfire, too, because that beer made it in there before they even made it back into their, you know, into their thing. And uh, it's just simple stuff like, just because I'm Thunderbird 1, I'm not going to quit being me. And I'll throw one more thing in. You know, I had a former commander say, he told me when I was taking command, he said, uh, can you imagine if I was at Home Depot on a Saturday and somebody who's, who knew I was Thunderbird once saw me and I hadn't shaved? And I was like, yes. <laughs> you know, but to me, I'm like, why, why do you think of yourself in that way? You know, you're just a normal guy and people should see that. And one of the things that I, I did too on the Thunderbirds is we got rid of that ascot. So, Ascot was cool when Fred Astaire wore it, you know, <laughs> but when it's explaining to the generals, they're like, well, why do you want to get rid of it? And they get, we go, well, we know it's uncomfortable. I go, no, we're a fire squad. We can do uncomfortable all day long. I want to get rid of it because kids don't understand it. You look like they think you're Superman. And I go, I want a kid to look at me and go, that's a normal guy with an incredible job. He's just a normal person. I might be able to do that. Not something that they don't even know what it is, you know, that's confusing. So we got rid of it. I Sorry, like I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> what lessons learned would you share with uh, a 15-year-old high school kid uh, about a career? Who's thinking about a career in aviation? I would tell them that, you know, I, I think it, aviation is an incredible teacher. It teaches you life lessons that you can carry into any type of business. You can carry into relationships, your family. And I said, if you, if you decide to treat aviation with the respect it deserves, with a reverence, it's not your God, it's not your family. But when you step to an airplane to fly, you know, those, those laws of aerodynamics don't change for you. You have to treat it with a reverence. And so I would say it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to start into and, and treat it with respect and take the lessons that it teaches you and apply them to the rest of your life. Like that. All right, you guys, um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna go to audience questions. We move the mics to the back of the room so it might be a little bit easier for you guys to get there and and queue up, so um, while I'm asking, uh, or Kevin's answering this last question, please uh, move to the microphones. And we do wanna use those so our live stream audience can, can hear the questions, all right? Um, so we talked about the ups and downs and the highs and lows um, of this job. Is it, is it really as cool as it looks? <laughs> yeah, it is really as cool as it looks. <laughs> but not for the reasons that you're thinking, you know? It, it's kinda, it kinda piggyback on the answer of the last question. It, it's as cool as it looks because of the lessons that I was able to learn, because of the friendships I was able to build, because of the camaraderie that I have with the people that I flew with and worked with in squadrons who fixed the airplanes, all those different things, that, that is incredible. To be around people who are striving for excellence on a daily basis, getting pretty close sometimes, and they not only would lay down their life for their country, but they would lay down their life for you. That is as cool as it gets. And uh, one story I, I like to tell is, uh, you know, I was out with my squadron. We were on temporary duty somewhere. We were in a bar. Somebody pushed me into this big guy, spilled his drink, and he, he wasn't having any of it. I offered to buy him a drink. Nope, he's going he's gonna to kick, you know, my ass. And we're going to step outside. I go, come on, let me just buy you a drink. We'll call it. Nope. I go, okay. I didn't even look around. I said, you know what the difference is between me and you? I have no, no doubt you can beat me up. But I got 30 buddies in this bar, and a good portion of them, I'm pretty sure, are probably looking at you right now. I said, why don't you take a look around? And I just stared at his face, and he looked left, 
and he looked right. He said, I'll take the drink. <laughs> I put my arm around him, I go, whatever you want, you know, buy the drink. But I didn't even have to look. I knew my guys, were, I knew my guys would see that happen, and they, they're just paying attention, right? We don't want to fight. We, we, got, we got other countries and people to fight when our nation calls. We don't need to do it in a bar. All right, uh, do we have any questions? No questions? I'm expecting right. someone to ask me why I didn't do better and become an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> but I should have tried harder. <laughs> I think we got a question back there. Hi there, thanks for your service. We really appreciate You're very it. Very welcome. I was wondering if uh, you guys use simulators. Uh, we all talk about the flight deck not always being the best learning environment, and I was curious if you use simulators for some of your initial training and that sort of thing. Yeah, this, the simulators have gotten really, really good. They don't really help for flying an air show, um, but the simulators have gotten really good for combat training. And uh, the F-22 simulators are incredible. We used, to, we used to have little ones that all it was was, you know, there's no dome, no nothing. We used to have to go to St. Louis to fly dome in the F-15. Now every squadron, or at least the bases, the squadrons have ones that are really good for just training. We call it playing the piccolo, right? Because every, every finger has a button, and depending on where this switch is, the, this button might have like 52 different uses, right? So anyway, you have to learn how to do all that. And then, but now they're all tied in together. So I was the commander of the first fighter wing during that F-22 stand down for the difficulty of breathing uh, type thing. And um, man, the simulators really kept us alive as far as keeping up proficiency. And we could take a four ship and put them in the simulators at Langley Air Force Base, tie them in to other, uh, other simulators at bases all over the world. And we've had these huge, you know, these huge wars where you're going like 80 some airplane against, you know, 220 adversaries. And you can do that in the, and it, it becomes, I mean, it's not flying, but it, really good for practicing all the communications and, and you get the time to, to debrief it and really glean some good lessons learned out of it as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, they're, they're pretty amazing now. We have another one back there. Hi, my name's uh, Steve. I want to introduce you to somebody I just met this morning, Ella. She's solo to glider. She can't get her private yet because she's only 15 years old. She has a question for Colonel Robbins. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations on the solo and the glider. Thank you so much. I was just wondering if we've had our first female Thunderbird pilot yet. Oh. Well, we actually, my first season, so when I went down, I talked about going to Luke Air Force Base to learn to fly the F-16. Nicole Malakowski was there with me. She was an F-15E pilot, and she was also joining the, the team at the same time as me. And uh, so we went through F-16 training together, and then we spent two years on the team together. And she, um, she did an amazing job, was a fantastic ambassador for the Air Force. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think, I, I talked to her recently, and, and, and we both apologized to each other for different things. But I told her I, I, I probably could have helped alleviate her pressure more. The, the pressure of being the first female Thunderbird, I think, was pretty immense. She handled it. She did it really well. But I, I could have helped. You know, I had my hands full, but I could have helped her more, I think. Uh, anyway, so yes. And then, the, and then uh, the, the year after, as I was leaving the team, the next year, no. The next year, we got, another, we got a female solo pilot. So we had two, two female pilots on the team at the same time. And there's been more since then. Yeah, a couple been of more since yeah. then. Yeah. And, you know, this is... I probably shouldn't tell the story, but I will. There's a good-natured <laughs> good rivalry among the Thunderbird pilots, right? Because we all came from different backgrounds. Some are S16, F15, F15E, A10 occasionally. And uh, so I had a reporter ask me questions in the briefing room before an air show, and all the pilots are there. They're kind of listening, and I'm talking to the reporter. And I had a little bit of a rapport with the reporter. And uh, she said, well, well, what's it like having the first female pilot on the team? And, and I said, well, because I knew they were all listening. I said, well, I." I think it's perfect because every time I climb into an F-16, I feel like a girl. And uh, I got lots of papers and stuff thrown at me, all mostly from Fifi, and, uh, but it was a good-natured rivalry there. But yeah, they, they were phenomenal pilots. Thank you so much. Go ahead. 
Hi, my name is Brett from Texas, and I just have a question. We've learned a lot about some of the technologies that are coming about, and you have a phenomenal career, and I thank you for your service. And I'd just like to find out what excites you about the technology that's out there. You know, it's exciting to see, like, in the F-22. I mean, it just keeps getting better and better, which is scarier because it gets more and more lethal, which is great, but that, why do we need more lethality? We need more lethality because there's, the threats are becoming more and more lethal. And when I worked on Capitol Hill, congressman said, you know, hey, Hollywood, do, do we really need this F-22 to defend our country? I'm like, no, you mean to defend the physical United States? No, we don't. But if we want to go exert power over another country somewhere else in the world, we absolutely need it because the surface to air missiles are becoming phenomenal. And so, you know, that's the part of technology that scares me. But the difference in even flying the F-15, when I started, the radar, the radar does this, and you can, you can see it doing this. So it, it looks from high to low or however you set it up, but it does this. And uh, in order to get all the data off a target back then, you had to lock it. So it takes a while to build track files. Then you lock onto one target, you get all the data, which what's the heading, the aspect, the airspeed, all that. But then when you go back to this, you've got to build track files again. So anyway. You didn't want to go single target track if you didn't have to. So you literally would go, you'd look and go, it hit the, that target on the third bar. I'm looking this altitude, third bar should be about here. And in your mind, go, I think that target's probably around 26,000 feet. Well, now you just put your cursor over that. You don't have to put your cursor over it. The, ra the radar does all that for you. And the F-22, it used to be very important in the F-15 to know where the data was coming from. The F-22, you have no idea where the data is coming from. It's getting data from different aircraft, from wingmen, from AWACS, from places on the ground, and uh, you can get a shoot quality target that, that gets identified for you, and you don't even know if it's your radar that's supporting that. It, it's, it's mind boggling. And so when you talk about the technology, you know, I'm out of that business. So that's, other people do that now. That's not something, that, something I'm really doing. But having done what I did for ConocoPhillips, I just see how much more safety there is. You know, there's a network of creating safety, and I think the technology allows us to do that. And, uh, you know, you have the, the safety makes up for a lack of proficiency in, in some pilots, you know, because, you know, the technology makes up for that. We got one more back there. Yes. Hey, Adam Fox, the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission. I want to say real quick, Ella, if you want to be a Thunderbird, you're in the best position to become one, and I really hope that you pursue it if you want to. Uh, so... So you mentioned Top Gun, so I have a fun question. I know at some point in your career, you had to relate to a character in Top Gun. Who was that character and why? <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> you know, there was a Hollywood in Top Gun. He got shot down. So <laughs> Wood's been hit. Wood's been hit. Uh, you know, I don't know that I related. Uh, you know, my experience in Fighter Squadron is so different from, you know, of course, that's a Hollywood movie, right? That, you do, you know, I just recently talked to some cadets from uh, Montana State University. I had coffee with one of the cadets. And, you know, they're like, well, well what, what's it like? What should we do? I go, be a team player. Work super hard and help everybody around you. Even when you're competing directly with that person, you help them. It'll make you better. And, uh, you, you know, that, that whole rivalry there, it, it's just not like that between Iceman and, you know, and Maverick. But um, it, it's a different environment. And a, in a much healthier, better environment. But I did, I did have an opportunity to spend a few days with uh, the writer of Top Gun 2, so uh, I'm, I'm worried that some of my stories might get taken, and the next time I tell it, they'll go, you just got that from Top Gun. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Do you guys wear G-suits during the routines? We do, yes. I, I don't think the Blue Angels do, but um, they didn't when I was on the team, but they also... Uh, someone unfortunately crashed and died during that time uh, from a G-lock on the, on the Blue Angels. Um, I don't know if they went to wearing G-suits. I'm not sure why they wouldn't if they're not. There's no reason not to, but um, makes a, it makes a big difference. And if you, have to do, if you have to do that straining maneuver perfectly every time you pull G's, yeah, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier, and like, it would scare the, the heck out of me to go step if I didn't have, you know, if nothing else, when that thing starts to inflate, it re, it, it's a physical reminder that you need to do the straining maneuver. So 
I think it's a very important thing. And unfortunately, last year, the Thunderbirds uh, had number four crash and died from a G-induced loss of consciousness uh, during a practice session. So. How many um, Gs are you pulling at, at the most during one of your routines? As lead, there was only one time I really pulled, I pulled, I forget what the target was, maybe seven and a half or eight uh, briefly, but the solos pull a lot of Gs. You know, the, the one solo does a, a 9G 360 degree turnout in front of the crowd uh, on the deck. They, they pull a lot of Gs in that aircraft. I rode in a solo aircraft too when I first started and I, I was worn out because it, it wears you out more in the back seat because you don't know exactly what's coming next. And, uh, but yeah, the, the G, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very real threat especially when you're low to the ground. My best friend in the Air Force uh, died back in the early 90s from a, a G-induced loss of con consciousness at low altitude. Got one uh, question back there. Hi, my name's Jonathan. Um, I teach science and I build STEM programs. And so I'm always thinking about where technology is headed. And so you've just been speaking about the human limits of enduring G-forces. And so I'm wondering if you have any sense of how close air combat is, is coming to becoming something that won't involve human flyers in the cockpit anymore and then might not eventually involve humans at all, might be something that's just governed entirely by artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I think that's the path we're on. I mean, we're, de we're definitely on that path and we're probably farther down that path than any of us would, would probably realize. But thank you. Right now, right now we're just not to that point. I mean, I just read recently they're talking about unmanned platforms to fly with a manned platform because you know you can't your limitation is if you're flying from Guam all the way to defend the Straits of Taiwan from China you know it's a long way to go and you're gonna run out of missiles and gas and then you're gonna turn around and come back and so now they're gonna they, they want to have these unmanned platforms to carry missiles so that now I'm in an F-22 and I can shoot a missile off this unmanned platform that's flying as you know my wingman out there and uh, you know they're looking at all those things to solve. Those are very difficult problems. If we want to, uh, you know, exert power in different parts of the world, and if we're committed to defending some of our, our allies that we've said we're committed to, you know, like that, that's a tough, that is a tough nut to crack. And you know they're trying to figure, constantly trying to figure out ways to solve those types of problems. Thank you. Do we have one last question back there? Is that yes? Could you uh, talk about other changes you made, and um, also can the next uh, commander reverse any of those changes, or are, are you have your changes um, been sustained throughout the time? Well, um, I made a point, and uh, when I left the Thunderbirds, uh, like I'm, I, I'm done. I'm done with the Thunderbirds, other than to be supportive. If I want to do anything, all I'm going to do is be supportive. I'm not going to question their changes. I'm not going to do any of that. Because I had plenty of people doing that to me when I was on the team. A lot of great, alum thunder great alumni Thunderbirds. There's also some that wanted, to, you know, well, you should take that reposition a little higher. I'm like, because well, that's what you did in the F4 back in 1973? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I, I get it. I'm listening to you. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, I got I to gotta show to, you know, you got to let it go. And so I'll talk about a couple more of the changes I made, but I purposely just haven't looked back. And, uh, and when I've, I've been at a couple air shows, I go, I, go say, I go say thanks, and I say, hey, I go, hey, your jets look great. And uh, I was up in Alaska. I walked down the whole line, said hi to everybody working on the aircraft, and said hi to them and stuff. And when I was walking back out, one of them goes, hey, sir, are you Boss Robbins? I go, I am. And they're going, hey guys, and they all came. They all came over, and we we talked a little bit, you know, about they had heard stories and stuff. And um, but I'm like, I don't need to. I don't need to tell them I'm Boss Robbins. I don't need to go tell them. I mean, Chuck Yeager told my guys one time at an air show that the jets looked like shit and they were dirty. And I'm like, why would you do that? You know, you're a legend. You don't need to. You know, I'm like, and the jets aren't dirty. You know, I'm like, they're not. <laughs> Uh, he came to my squadron one time after that. I talked to some people who knew him. So uh, he, he, he's got this whole room, we're a room full of World War II veterans, and he's with them. And he goes, so he had been asking me questions about why we wear our gloves and stuff in front of everybody, why we wear the gloves we do on the Thunderbird. I'm like, they're just gloves, or, you know. And, uh, and he goes, well, what's wrong with this fighter squadron? He goes, do you not drink coffee anymore in the squadron? I haven't seen a coffee pot around here. <laughs> and I said, there's coffee. I go, we have coffee upstairs. And he goes, well, I want a cup. And so I just said, in front of everybody, we just finished, I go, well, do you expect me to be your bitch, or do you want to walk up with me and get a cup of coffee? 
He got the biggest grin on his face. And that's, my friend said, just punch him right in the face, you know? And he put his arm around me, and we were best buddies. We went and got coffee and walked, and walked around. But, um, OK, a couple changes I made on the team. I had three and a half months. I built a plan. I built a timeline. Because you can't, if you're going to make big changes, you can't give somebody a gigantic pill and jam it down their throat, right? There has to, it's incremental changes. And so I timelined it out and did it. One of the, one of the first things were like, boss, what, what uh, show suits do we need to order for next year? And when I was there, they were, they were wearing five different show suits every weekend. They had red, they had black, they had dark blue, they had royal blue, and r some other color. But literally, going to the show on Thursday, they'd wear one. Practice on Friday, they'd wear a different one. Show Saturday, a different one. Show Sunday on a different one. Monday, a different one. And uh, so I go, we're just blue. We're the ambassadors in blue. Just order blue. And uh, the officers are like, whoa, 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 hang on a second. We can't, we can't wear the red ones? And I go, look, I, I'm no marketing major, but Coca-Cola does not change the way their can looks. They want you to be able to recognize that someone's drinking a Coke from the other side of the room. You told me when you wear red, you sometimes get conf they, people confuse you with the red arrows from Canada. When you wear black, people think you're the Golden Knights Army jump team. I go, we're the ambassadors in blue. We're going to look the same every time. And they're like, can't we wear red on fourth Street? Stop. <laughs> no. One color, that's it. You know, so we went, we went to one color. But to me, I'm just like, well, why all these other colors? You know? And it, it, things like they had going aways for the officers. And uh, they had a red carpet that would come out of the bar into the hangar. And it would go and make a 90-degree long red carpet. It had these big fancy chairs at the end. And the whole squad would line up on either side of that and stand at parade rest until the officer going away would come to you and you'd come to attention. They'd say their goodbyes, whatever. you go back to parade rest and I'd do it. First time I did one, they were really proud of themselves that they had done it in under two and a half hours. Oh, no. But, but I'm like, how does, this, how does this support our mission? This is self, it, it's just gratuitous. And why does, it, why does any major captain or lieutenant colonel at the time think that they're worth people standing at parade rest for two and a half hours? It doesn't make any sense. We're not doing this anymore. You know, so it's just, if it didn't have to do with the mission, there was a lot of just Thunderbird stuff, you know? And uh, like the, the videos, you know, you go, you have promotional videos to go take to high schools and schools and stuff when you do it, right? It's all Thunderbird stuff. I'm like, I want to open it up with stuff blowing up. I want to see green and gray aircraft. I want to see people jumping out of airplanes. I want to see dropping cargo. I want, you know, and then you throw in some Thunderbird stuff. But what, you know, the only reason we fly these flashy red, white, and blue jets is to bring attention to us. We can go, hey, let me introduce you to the 560,000 people who are in your United States Air Force. And uh, so I made, I made a lot of changes like that. I would say hundreds and hundreds of small changes that took us from being a air show squadron to being a fighter squadron that flies air shows. So it didn't have to, if it didn't help us represent the regular Air Force, we didn't do it anymore. So. All right, I'm gonna take the last question. You left your beautiful wife and daughter at home in Bozeman. There's a picture of Kiplin, you sent that to me <laughs> a couple <laughs> months ago when she turned six months old. Looks like we might have a fledgling astronaut. Uh, coming, right? There, there you go. That's what you do when you're unemployed. And, uh, you know, I'm like, she needs to be an astronaut for a six month picture. Where's the aluminum foil? So, so my question for you is it, is it harder to be a fighter pilot or has it been tougher to be a dad? Um, you know, it's pretty easy, pretty easy being a dad, but I'm, I'm pretty, pretty soft. So uh, being a fighter pilot is easy to keep that mission focused. And uh, do the same thing with this kid. I'm like, if it's not going to make her a better person later on, we, we're not going to do it. Um, but man, being a dad is, uh, I thought that ship had sailed for me. And it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing, as most everybody in this room, most of the men in this room probably know. But I'm, I'm having a blast, absolute blast. Awesome. Kevin, thanks for coming out here on short notice today. It's been great. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you guys. Yeah,